Welcome to sermons from St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Minot, North Dakota. St. Paul's is anchored in the message of Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins, for the church and for the world. The following sermon is from Rev. Dr. Matthew Richard. Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. If I were Jesus, yes, if I were Jesus, I would have let those disciples have it that evening when they were all huddled up in fear in that upper room in Jerusalem. Yes, if I were Jesus, I would have told those disciples that they were a bunch of weak-willed, sleeping, betraying cowards who left me in the time of my greatest need. I would have also signaled out Peter. I would have zeroed in on Peter and called him out for his big talk and his puny little actions. So Peter, what's this? What's this about I hear you being a rock, a big tough man? Couldn't you even stand by me during that time in front of a little servant girl? You surely talk the talk, Peter, like a big man. However, well, you're a lot of talk and not much action. Yes, indeed, if I were Jesus, I would have gotten after them for their spineless actions. I would have asked them, you know, I rose from the dead, and now you are hiding here in this upper room with a tiny little lock on the door. Now, do you feel safe now that the lights are dimmed and you're whispering and you have a locked door? But dear friends, I'm not Jesus. God be praised for that. You see, three days after Jesus died, he entered into that upper room where the disciples had locked themselves in for fear of the Jews, fear of the Jewish leaders. And get this, Jesus, he did not come into that upper room to chastise or rebuke the disciples. He did not come into that room to chastise or rebuke them. So if Jesus did not rebuke and chastise the disciples in that upper room, what did he do when he came into that room with the disciples right after the resurrection? Well, we should note, for starters, Jesus did not come into that upper room to tell his disciples how to fortify that upper room, how to maybe get proper locks on the door, and how to wear perhaps a good disguise in public. Jesus also did not give them instructions on how to gather survival food, to prep for the days to come, to keep off the radar of the Jewish leaders, if you will. Jesus also did not come up in that upper room and say, let's huddle together now. I have a strategic plan 
and action steps for us to accomplish in the days to come. Jesus, he also did not have a military plan, a military campaign, a political policy ready to go for the disciples. You know, Jesus, he did not even have a marketing campaign to sway public opinion or perhaps clever talking points that he could gather to sway the masses. Jesus did not have any tricks up his sleeve or any deceptive plans to manipulate the general public through, yes, mass psychosis. No, he had none of this. And he did none of this. Instead, get this. Jesus, he chased away their fear. He chased away their fear by saying to them, Peace be with you. Yes, peace be with you. And so Jesus, he chased away their fear by pronouncing peace in that room in front of them. And then right there in that upper room, he gave the disciples their mission and purpose in the days ahead. Yes, he gave them their mission and purpose. And that purpose and that mission is simply this, to forgive sins. Jesus told the disciples this. He said, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are unforgiven. And so, dear friends, it's really rather simple. It's actually quite simple indeed. The mission and the purpose of the early apostles back in that book of John, in that upper room, was simply to speak the words of forgiveness. They were to preach Christ crucified and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins. This is the ministry of the early apostles. And frankly, it is the ministry of the church and her pastors to this day right now. Indeed, it is about the forgiveness of sins. Just as Jesus called the disciples to stand in the stead and in his stead, and to deliver his forgiveness, deliver his blood, not as some sort of sacrifice to God, but a gift to the people, just as he called them to do that. The Lord still calls his church and pastors to do the same. And so what this means, practically stated, is this. St. Paul's Lutheran Church, this church, your church, exists primarily for the deliverance of, of the forgiveness of sins to anyone and everyone who might receive the forgiveness of sins. Deliver Christ and his gift of forgiveness. That's it. But my friends, not everyone wants the church to be about the forgiveness of sins. Indeed, there's much pushback in our culture. Just the other day, a person came to our church and talked to one of our members. The person, they wanted help from the church to pay their rent the church member kindly expressed to that person that St. Paul's already gives money towards the homeless coalition. We give money towards the food pantry and the pregnancy center as acts of mercy, as acts of compassion for our culture. Mercy beyond these walls. However, the member went on to say that St. Paul's does not give money towards a personal rent. And so the person, well, they sighed really loudly, and then they said, well... <laughs> What do you do around here then? The member responded graciously and kindly, we're about the forgiveness of sins. Yes, we're about the forgiveness of sins. And then the person responded by saying, well, whatever, have a nice day. And they left. Dear friends, please be aware that many in our culture and even from inside the church in America do not want the church to be about the forgiveness of sins. Now, I'm not en entirely sure why. Indeed, I'm not entirely sure why. It may be that the forgiveness of sins is not flashy enough for some. Or perhaps, maybe the forgiveness of sins does not meet up with the popular fads of the day. Maybe the forgiveness of sins, maybe it hits a little too close to home for some people. Regardless of the reason, though, it is true that not everyone wants the church to be about the forgiveness of sins, but instead, something else. You see, all you have to do is look around at various churches, whether you hear them on social media or look at their website, and you will see different things that churches are focusing on. Some churches, well, they focus on being an emotional support group for people, places of fellowship and fun to gather together on a Sunday. 
Other churches, they may focus on being a political action group, doing political policy, work on a social justice reform for culture. Other churches, they may function as self, self-help venues where you go to hear pointers on how you can live your best life now, how you can find tricks in this life. Frankly, the list could go on and on and on. And so, perhaps you may be thinking, are we saying that all of these churches are missing the mark? I mean, really, are we saying that all of these churches are missing the mark? Yes, that is exactly what we are saying this day. We are exactly saying that specific point. And we can say this not because of some sort of arrogance that we have here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church, but we say it because Jesus clearly lays forth his mission for the church, for those apostles, for this church in our reading from the Gospel of John. The church and its pastors are to be about the forgiveness of sins. I'm actually reminded of the words of a wise pastor who preached at a seminary graduation. Now, a seminary is a place where pastors are trained, and so this was a bunch of newbies, a bunch of new pastors entering into the ministry for the first time. Well, this veteran and wise pastor, he wanted to warn the new pastors about the temptation to forget their mission and their calling. And he said this to them. Dear young pastors, what you are stepping into is the preaching office. Don't forget that. Your relationship to the congregation is the same as the prophet to Israel. Work on teaching and converting your own people, which includes scores of folks not on the books. Preach the gospel to them, the gospel, the forgiveness of sins. Preach it from the pulpit. Preach it from behind the desk. Preach it from the podium and the bedside. When they come looking for marital advice, tell them about Jesus dying for them. They come looking for sympathy and a listening ear. Tell them about Jesus dying for them. They have a new baby. They have lost their jobs. They're afraid of retirement. Tell them about Jesus dying for them. No matter what the circumstance, no matter what the situation, never compromise the simple truth that has saved you. Christ has forgiven you. Perhaps we could say a warning is also needed not only for pastors, but is also needed for parishioners as well. I imagine if this pastor would address parishioners, perhaps we could say it this way. He would say something such as this. Remember, dear parishioners, what you are stepping into on Sundays. Don't forget that this church is about the forgiveness of sins. And so when you look up front and you see that font, do not forget that this is where the guilt of your sins was forgiven through that mighty word, um, mighty water, that mighty water of baptism. And when you look and see a man clothed in a white robe, remember that he is there to pronounce the forgiveness of sins into your ears. Not to entertain you, not to do tricks, but to deliver the forgiveness of sins into your ears as he preaches from the pulpit and lectern. And when you look at that table, when you look at that table, indeed, know that this is where you get forgiveness laid upon your tongues and your lips. What this means is that if the church is struggling with the budget, do not let this distract you from the forgiveness of sins given to you in that sanctuary. If there are fights in the church, if there's gossip in the church over the color of the carpet, do not let this divert you from the forgiveness of sins given at that rail. If a church down the street is doing something exciting and something innovative, something that is catching everyone's attention, do not let that sidetrack you from hearing about the forgiveness of sins from that pulpit. Never let anything come before the forgiveness of sins. Remember, even if every program of the church falls apart, if the bulletins don't print and the website crashes, if the coffee is burnt and the donuts do not have enough cream filling, if sidewalks are not perfectly clean of snow, and if the attendance is lacking at a LWML or LYF or LLL event, and even if the Lutheran Church Missouri Senate completely folds and falls apart, well, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. The reason being, if you have received the forgiveness of sins, all of those things are secondary. They're just details. Baptized saints, the church, yes, the church itself is not founded on these little things, but upon Christ. 
and his forgiveness. The gates of Hades may overcome many things in this life, but they will not, they will not overcome Christ and his unending forgiveness, which is for you and for me. Baptized saints, at St. Saint Paul's, we are about forgiveness of sins. We are about the forgiveness of sins in this church because we are about Jesus. And the reason why we are about Jesus is because Jesus is about you and me. We know from this last Friday that Jesus, he bled and died on that cross for our sins. And he rose that Sunday for our justification and for our assurance. And to ensure that we would never lose heart and that he would chase away all fear, the Lord constantly comes to you and me to give us forgiveness, life, and salvation from this font, from this podium, and this pulpit, and from this table so that we would never lose heart and that we would know that we are truly forgiven. And so let me say it again. In the stead, and by the command of Jesus, you are forgiven of all of your sins. Peace be with you, brothers and sisters. It's all about the forgiveness of sins. The rest is just details. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thy strong word bespeaks us righteous, bright with thine own holiness. Thank you for listening to today's podcast sermon. You can access a full manuscript of today's sermon from Pastor Matthew Richard's blog at www.pastormatrichard.org or visit St. Paul's website at www.stpaulsminot.org. The Lord bless and keep you.